Hello everyone, my name is James Scott uh, from Success Coaching and uh, welcome to CSM Mastermind. Uh, it's great to have you here today as we launch this new content series for customer success professionals. I'm coming to you today from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, one of the fastest growing technology hubs in North America. And I couldn't be more excited about this first episode of CSM Mastermind. So first of all, what is CSM Mastermind? Well, uh, the inspiration came from conversations that uh, myself and my partners have had with uh, CSMs all around the, the world uh, over the last few months. Uh, we get this common theme coming out of all these conversations, which is uh, there's a lot of thought leadership in the world of customer success, a lot of blogs, you know, a lot of people doing podcasts, talking about things that, um, that they're doing um, as leaders in customer success. But we felt like there was a gap to hear from the actual practitioners themselves, the CSMs, the customer success managers, who are doing all the hard work every day. Uh, so we thought we'd put together this uh, CSM mastermind and give you a chance to hear from other people just like you and uh, hopefully learn from some of their experiences, some of their uh, tips and techniques for making uh, their own careers successful. Um, and I think the, you know, the other issue with customer success is often yeah, we're part of small teams. It's kind of a lonely, a lonely role. Um, you know, we're part. We're either the only CSM, or maybe we're one of a, a few CSMs in our company. And uh, even if we're part of a bigger team, the depth of customer success experience is, is usually quite shallow, uh, because everybody is, you know, everybody's kind of learning this at the same time. It's a relatively young discipline. Uh, it's not something you can just go to your CEO and say, "Hey, tell me about you did how you did customer success 20 years ago." And it doesn't work like that. So as customer success managers, we have to turn outward. We have to look outward um, to our community for help and guidance. And um, you know, I think that's why things like this hopefully will be really valuable. So uh, that's what we're going to do. And so without further ado, I want to introduce today's topic, which is segmenting your portfolio for maximum impact. Why do we pick this topic? Well, we know that pretty much every CSM is time poor, right? You have many accounts to manage and just not enough hours in the day to get through your to-do list. And so it's a common pain point that we hear as we're talking to CSMs. So we thought it'd be interesting to explore how some expert CSMs go about choosing to spend their time. How do they prioritize? How do they choose how to spend that finite resource they have any given day so that they have the maximum possible impact, positive impact on their account portfolio. So join us as we find out how they do it. Uh, how, how do these CSMs improve their personal efficiency and maximize uh, the, the results? Um, now, before we get into actually meeting our CSMs for today, our expert panel, I just want to let you know that for those of you listening to this live, uh, we, this is interactive. We are going to be accepting questions. So if you do have questions, please post them in the Q&A panel within your Zoom uh, webinar uh, app. Uh, we will review those periodically as we're going through the, uh, the content and try and weave them into the conversation. So um, if you have, com you know, have questions for our panel, ask them, ask them at any time. Please don't feel the need to wait till the end. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our expert CSMs for today's call. Each of these CSMs has been recommended to us by someone we know and trust. So these, these folks are the best of the best, world class, and they've got the battle, the battle scars to prove it. So uh, on your screens now, you'll be seeing uh, Elizabeth Allen, who's a CSM at User IQ, uh, Cash Young, who's a team lead at Signals Analytics, and Marta Montero, who's a CS coach at eCompliance. So welcome to all of you, and thank you for being part of this first CSM Mastermind. And I'd like to start by giving you each a chance to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your journey uh, to where you are today in the world of customer success. Uh, Elizabeth, would you like to start us off? Sure. Hi. Thanks for having me. So I'm Elizabeth Allen, and I'm a customer success manager at User IQ, which is a customer success platform in helping businesses align around their users' needs. So when James said CSM roles can be lonely, uh, luckily I work with a ton of CSMs. Uh, I'm helping CSMs to understand adoption within their own platform. And that's actually my favorite part of the role is getting a glimpse into all of these other businesses. 
That's great. Great to have you with us. I think you're going to have some probably some unique perspective because of uh, all these conversations you're having every day. So I look forward to that. Uh, Marta, would you like to go next? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Marta Montero. I am a customer success coach at eCompliance. We're a health and safety software company. Up until about two weeks ago, I was the only enterprise CSM. Uh, so it was a bit of a lonely team. And uh, someone has recently joined, which is fantastic. I'm really excited to learn nice. from her. Um, I've been in different CSM roles for five years. And even though my title has always been a customer success coach or customer success manager, uh, I've done a little bit of onboarding, a little bit of support. What I've found I love the most is actually the coaching part of being a customer success manager. And that's the role that I'm in now. I find that helping customers meet their end goals and helping customers solve their business needs is really how we can drive a lot of value. And I love being a part of that. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that's probably something we, we all share, um, that opportunity to help others be the best version of themselves. So, uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing more from you on that topic. And then last but not least, Cash. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Cash. I am a customer success team lead at Signals Analytics in New York City. Um, we are a data anal analytics platform. And um, I've been working in customer success for about eight years now in various different roles, um, onboarding, renewals, expansions, all that really great stuff. And I think one of my favorite parts of customer success is that I'm very organized and process driven. So I definitely believe that there are certain processes that can be replicated across different customer success scenarios. And I really like putting those into place just to make life easier. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we talk a lot about playbooks, don't we? But we often don't have many playbooks of our own. So I'd love to hear more about how you go about making, making process and uh, keeping that kind of repeatability and consistency uh, within, within your company. So we'll definitely get to that. I think, I think that's probably got a big part to play in uh, managing, managing time. Absolutely. Um, good stuff. All right. Um, and, and then maybe just another general question just to help um, those listening learn a little bit more about uh, your day-to-day could each of you just explain a little bit about your portfolio of accounts and roughly how many customers you look after, what sort of size they are? Um, yeah, just give, you know, customer success comes in different flavors, right? And so uh, it'd be good to understand what it looks like at your organization. Uh, should we go the same order as before? Sure. Yeah, so I manage just under 40 accounts. We are still startup. And so our my account portfolio ranges from enterprise down to startups even smaller than we are. So I have a full, the full gamut of customer types. Great. So it's, uh, this call came at a very interesting time because we just changed up our segmentation model. Um, even though I've always managed our enterprise segment, uh, what we consider enterprise has changed a little bit. It used to be based very much on ARR, and now we're switching more to company size and um, the number of, of employees that a company has. And so I manage uh, around 35 accounts, give or take a few, uh, and it ranges anywhere from smaller ARR where my focus is mostly on growing that account to some companies with quite large ARR um, in the six figures, so. Got it, great. Um, yes, and I am personally responsible for three accounts, um, but as a team lead, I do oversee our entire book of business. Our clients, I would say, aren't necessarily enterprise, they're global, they're major corporations. Um, and when we manage an account, quote unquote, um, within that account, there might be different engagements for the particular brands within that corporation. So one account I'm, I'm managing actually has three or four brands within it, and they all have separate engagements. Got it. Okay. So that starts to add another layer of complexity uh, to your day, I'm sure, as you try and prioritize. <laughs> even within a customer, you're doing some prioritization. Absolutely. And they're yeah. all different teams and, you know, different contacts. So. Right. Right. Sounds fun. <laughs> okay. Cool. Good. Well, let's, I think a couple of you touched on the topic of segmentation and how you sort of think about your account portfolio. Um, you know, I think 
if I said segmentation to most CSMs, we'd probably think of revenue, right? We've got our high revenue, mm -hmm. our medium revenue, and our low revenue accounts. And sometimes um, a CSM will only be working on one of those segments. Sometimes they'll have a blend. Sometimes there won't be any CSMs on some of the lower revenue accounts. So, um, but, but I think segmentation is starting to get a little more sophisticated than that. And I think it probably needs to be for us to, uh, to do a good job. So um, what, what other ways do you think about your account portfolio and, and how you uh, sort of group customers? I mean, segmentation is grouping customers because they have something in common, right? So how, what other than revenue, what other dimensions do you use as you think about your account portfolios? I can, yeah, I can. Oh, go for it, Marta. All right. I'd be interested to hear your answer as well, Elizabeth. So can't wait for that. I think we'll have some overlap. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, so I think something that uh, I've taken to every CSM role I've ever had is that while there's a company wide or a success organization wide segmentation model, um, when you have your own portfolio, it's important to sub-segment it a little bit further to really understand where you as a CSM should be placing your time in order to maximize the value. So something I do, I'm extremely methodical in, in this in this sub-segmentation, let's call it, I do an expected value analysis. How much of my time am I going to put into this and how much value can I expect to get out of that? And there's a number of different things that go into it. So I look at uh, when is a customer renewing? I'm going to be spending a little bit more time on some of my customers that are renewing in the upcoming or obviously this quarter, but uh, the upcoming quarters than I am with customers who might be renewing, you know, in, in Q4, which is a little bit further away. That doesn't mean I'm ignoring them. It just means that I'm focusing a little bit more of my time and effort on them. I also take a look at what does my relationship look like? Um, at eCompliance, we're really lucky in that we actually measure this as a KPI. What's the relationship depth and what's the relationship breadth as well? How frequently am I talking to each of the key contacts within my relationships? So that gives me a really good indicator of where I'm at that I can use to then value or uh, um, analyze how much time I can spend on a client. Is it something where I need to be looking on LinkedIn and digging a little bit more on some of the uh, higher ups, some of these people that I'm missing? Or is it someone or an account where I have every contact that I need and I just have to focus more so on reaching out to them a little bit more? Got it. So just to interrupt you, you, you would focus your energy a little bit more on an account where you lacked breadth or lacked depth because you realize that creates some risk. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolute risk mitigation. Definitely. Okay. Then other things I look at as well is uh, use case depth and, or how sticky are the clients? Um, what's their adoption look like? Again, it goes back to risk. If a client is only using our product for one or two use cases, that's a little bit riskier than a client who's using us for five or six use cases. And so I'm going to be focusing on them a little bit more to understand what their business goals are to see what I can do to improve that adoption and improve that stickiness. Great. Love it. Uh, um, some interesting topics there, which we can dig into a little bit more, but I'm curious whether... Cash, Elizabeth, you've got other uh, dimensions that, that you think about within your portfolio. Yeah, so we are actually working on segmentation right now. So I, I have all these wonderful ideas. And the two things that I'm starting to look at, and um, Marta kind of touched on these, is the adoption of, of usage across the platform, but then also how mature the team is in terms of their ability to, you know, analyze and evaluate data. So we're looking at two personas, um, a power user and a regular user. Um, a power user we've identified as someone who not only you know, goes into the platform on a regular basis, but also acts as a gatekeeper where they can introduce our technology to other teams, other users that we would then define as regular users. So the power user would usually be the person who was initially sold the platform, we enable them, and then they go and kind of shop around our platform to other teams based on what they see. Um, we also, I'm also looking to, like I said, 
the maturity of how they look at data. So I have some companies that are very, very large. They have an entire sweep of data analytics people that you know are constantly crunching away at numbers. And then I have some brands that are a little bit smaller. They're not really sure what they're looking for. You know, maybe they don't have a power user on the account. So those are some of the things that we're looking for in terms of, you know, who we pay a lot of attention to. Um, when you look at revenue, some of the times companies that are spending a lot of money also do have a lot of internal resources and maybe don't need as much tactical handholding. Whereas some of the customers that are spending a little bit less money, you know, they do need more overarching strategy. So revenue is not always a great indicator of, you know, who needs help, but it definitely is a good indicator of like, you know, what the bottom line is. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because that actually, it almost, what you're almost saying is that you can spend a little less time with somebody that's got this internal team that is, you know, they've got a, they're spending more with you, but they're more likely to have that organizational structure that allows them to um, better utilize your tool and track value and things like that internally. And you might need to do a little bit more handholding with somebody that's a little bit further down into the revenue stack because they, they lack that internal team. Is, is that, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, I think, you know, with, with the companies that have more resources, it's more tactical because they already have the strategy in place. So you can just check in on them, make sure that they have everything that they need. Whereas the ones that are a little bit smaller are more strategic, right? They really need you to guide them into what the business value is of the platform. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. Elizabeth, did you want to add anything from your side? Sure. And as I expected, a lot of overlap. I'm also over here typing some notes. Um, <laughs> I'm loving the responses Marta and Cash gave. So similarly, you know, we're, we're gauged on customer retention. So looking at who's up for renewal next is a big piece. Um, but for the folks that are listening to this that don't have a fast cycle and you might just offer a one-time service, that's also important too, because if you're finishing up a service with someone, evaluating how did that experience go? Are we going to do business together again? I think it, it fits in with that nicely also. Um, we're also experimenting right now with segmenting by growth potential. So just looking at are we working with just one small part of a larger organization um, and what the growth potential is there? That's and so something good. else that we're doing that's similar to what Marta had said about adoption is we, we call it intended adoption. Um, our product does a lot of things. Not everyone buys it to do all of those things. So we actually had some tools within our platform to look at what did the person buy this for and are they using that today? And so we can see who is using those things that they bought for. And then that triggers us to know how, how healthy is this account? That's a really interesting point. I think you, well, you touched on two things there. One is the, the growth potential of an account. And I think that's, that's probably the first thing that we realized as an industry we were missing when we were segmenting by revenue because we had these small accounts that we didn't pay as much attention to and we, we missed the fact that actually that's where our upsell and our growth was most likely to come from um, in general. And then also within that, yeah. with, within that segment, there may be some you know, massive companies or you know, really good opportunities at, which would make it uh, worth over-investing uh, time and resources earlier in the relationship. Um, so I think that's interesting. And then the other point you touched on was around the intended use case versus the actual use case. And I think that's, you know, now we're starting to get closer to understanding outcomes and um, talking to our customers about whether they are achieving those outcomes and, and looking at customers and, uh, in a little bit more individual basis rather than just saying everybody should be using as much as possible of our product, which, which isn't always the case, as you, as you rightly pointed out. You could have two customers who have very different types of business and one customer is only using two out of 10 of your features, but those are the only two 10 they need and they're very happy with that. So let's not invest time trying to get them to use other things. That's just going to be wasted energy. So um, do you, um, how do you, how do you track? I guess that's me, maybe the next question for all of you is you've, you've brought up a bunch of really interesting segmentation strategies. How do you, how do you practically do this? Like, do you have like this crazy 
Excel spreadsheet or uh, Google Doc? How do you do, you do you score people or is it more just intuitive? You, how, how do you actually operationalize those segmentation strategies? A lot of CRM management uh, for one. And then um, we're lucky enough to have tools built into our own product that gives customers health scores. Um, and like I mentioned, can track, are they using those areas of the platform that they, they bought for? And then we can turn that into an alert or a segment that we can view. Got it. So you're, you're building out lots of custom CRM fields to define mm -hmm. the, uh, the intended use case. Okay. I definitely agree with you, Elizabeth, in terms of it's a lot of CRM management. One thing I've found as an individual contributor, I think it's important at the same time to be tool agnostic. Tools will help us get to what we want, but it's important for us to understand the theory behind everything. So the tools will help us do what we want a little bit better and a little bit faster. And that's where things like playbooks come in and we can automate some of these processes so that we're also doing them in a way that's um, you know, the same across, across the board. But one thing I always do is I export all of my Salesforce data and I take a look within Excel. Um, I build a bunch of pivot tables. Um, and sometimes I want to look at, you know, what's ARR for this product type when clients are renewing in this quarter. Um, I just do a lot of experimenting and, and poking at my own data within Excel to then bring that back into the tools and bring it back in and automate some of the things that I'm doing. That's, that's a really important point. And I, you know, I couldn't agree more. I think a lot of times we rush to technology to solve a problem or give us the answers and, um, and, and end up automating something that is flawed or isn't the best version of what we could achieve. So, um, yeah, I, I love the fact you kind of got that, that curiosity, that experiment. I love poking your own data. That's a, I think that's a quote that I'll remember for a while. Um, but yeah, so seeing what, kind of asking questions, like not necessarily going in knowing what you're looking for, just just asking questions and seeing what, what pops out. And then once you've tried a few things and found something that works, then start to make that a little bit more efficient using technology. That's great. Cash, anything to add on that theme of oper operationalization? Yeah, no, it, it's funny because normally, uh, you know, I, I would agree with Elizabeth um, and Marta a little bit more, but this role is a little unique. So um, our CS team is fairly new and our CRM is really, really geared for the sales team to use. So I'm being really disrupted by asking them to put in all these additional fields. So while that's in the process, um, I, I've noticed just in my career, CSMs, will sometimes have an aversion, kind of like what Marta said, to technology if they feel that they have to go into multiple different portals to get multiple different pieces of information and then some things aren't updated and they're not. So what I've actually started using um, to track just account health and like how I'm segmenting my different accounts is Trello. Um, it's free unless you want power-ups and I got a couple of different power-ups so I, I pay for it. But the great thing is, is that it will pull things from Salesforce, Google Drive, anything else that you're using into one view. So all of the information that I need from Salesforce is just on my account card. I have different labels for, you know, how they're doing in terms of the status that I will switch out. And then I have all the documents that are pertinent to that account um, linked directly through Google Drive. So my goal is eventually to move to a tools like Elizabeth's um, where I can, you know, have a system that does that for me automatically, but we still need to put the groundwork into place. And that's kind of what we're doing now. That's awesome. I love, I love that because it's a, um, because cheap, slow, you know, yeah. <laughs> you're right. You know, don't have an aversion to technology. That's the other end of the spectrum, right? Um, technology can help. And I like the fact that something like Trello that's, you know, cheap or free yeah, even if, you, if you're in a CSM as part of a team of five CSMs, but your company doesn't have, um, you know, a customer success management platform, or maybe you feel like there's an opportunity to improve on some of the data that's being collected, but there's maybe a little too much friction right now, or not enough of a clear business case to get that added into the main CRM, you can, you can hack it. We're a big fan of hacking at Success Hacker, you can, you know, you can come up with your own little tool, right? Um, 
and use that to manage just your accounts. And uh, that is a great example of using technology to make yourself more efficient uh, without going down that rabbit hole of like, now this is an implementation project that's going to take months. Right. The whole team exactly. and, the company, and then we might get it wrong and have to kind of undo it all again in six months time. So, yeah, I love that. Great example. So I've got a question, actually, from one of our listeners, from a, a star uh, who, uh, Marta, you'll be familiar with. Um, her question is for Elizabeth. How is the team identifying potential growth? So how do you identify that potential uh, upside in an account? Um, and, and, you know, who is responsible for, you know, making those calculations? Yeah, good question, Start. So this is something we really just started experimenting with. Um, and so far it's been um, based on feel of, you know, what I know of my accounts. Do they mention other departments that could benefit from using our tool? Um, do I know that this is just one division of a huge company? And we're starting to co-collaborate with our account executives as well to sort of do some research with us to find out where more growth might be within our existing accounts. Um, but really, we're, to answer who's responsible, we're, we're driving that right now. And a lot of it is based on anecdotal things we've heard, um, research that we've done. And um, it's not a perfect science yet. It's um, something that we're starting with, and we'll see how we use it. That's great. So you're in kind of the early stages, but you're leveraging data that exists elsewhere in the organization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, speaking to your sales colleagues and a lot of this information gets picked up during the sales cycle, doesn't it? So that's certainly a good yeah. place to start if the customer is still relatively young, relatively new to you, because that information will still be pretty accurate. Um, mm -hmm. If the customer has been with you a few years, then you might have to uh, discount some of that earlier information and, and do a little bit more of your own research. Right. That's great. Fantastic. And um, as a reminder, if you're listening live to this CSM Mastermind, you have the opportunity to ask questions of the panel. Please use the Q&A section of your Zoom webinar app. And uh, we'll be happy to put your questions uh, to, uh, to our expert CSMs. So, um, okay. So we've talked a little bit about segmentation strategy, right, the dimensions. And we talked a little bit about operationalization of those strategies. But here's the thing, and I don't know, I'll let you into a secret here. Um, don't tell anybody. But I have a plan when I come into work in the morning. It's a pretty good plan. Um, when I leave at the end of the day, I don't always uh, feel like I've accomplished what I set out to at the beginning of the day. So my point is the best strategies can often be de derailed by other things that come up. And I think in the world of customer success, that's a particularly uh, you know, um, common uh, uh, issue that we have to deal with. So how do you think about your time and your day and how you're going to keep to the plan, this great plan that you've come up, which, which tells you in theory where you should be spending your time? How do you make sure you're actually spending your time in those areas? Who wants to tackle that? Yeah, by the way, if you know the if you know the answer to this, you'll be you'll you'll be very rich because I think there's a lot of people. Would like to. I don't I don't think there's a good answer. I think as a as a CS uh, team lead, especially, I've just taken the course of almost being like a parent when your kid falls and just kind of ignore it. Um, but no, I think it's it's always important to remain calm, right? I think one of the mistakes that we make as CSMs is that we tend to be a lot more reactive when we could be being proactive. And as fires come up, we prioritize yeah. things that are immediate instead of the things that are long-term because we think to ourselves, oh, we have time. So the stance that I take is a lot of times when my CSMs come to me and they're freaking out, it's just, okay, just breathe, you know, calm down. And remember that if you need to make somebody wait until you can figure out a more complete answer or a solution to their problem, that is totally fine. Customers don't need a solution right away. They need a response right away. They need to know you're working on it. They need to know you're looking into it, but they don't need you to have the answer within 15 minutes unless they do and they communicate that. Um, and I think the other thing is, is, you know, not to be afraid to ask for deadlines. A lot of times when customers come to me and it seems like they're freaking out and, you know, it seems like things are really urgent 
and I'll say to them, okay, well, you know, when do you need this by? What's your internal deadline? And they'll be like, oh, next week. And, you know, from the sense of urgency in their email, you never would have known that you had an entire week. You would have stopped everything and, and did it right in that moment. So I think that, you know, it's always just taking a step back and thinking to yourself, I do want to be reactive right now. I want to help this person because it's in our nature. Um, but just really being even tactical about that. Like I get so sidetracked so easily and then hours have gone by and I haven't done the one thing I said I was going to do. But if I had asked maybe a few more questions, um, I could have found out that it wasn't that important. And also, you know, just having a good relationship with a lot of the other people on my team who I know will support me is also helpful because then I know immediately who to go to and, you know, possibly who else could pick up the slack if I don't have that, um, that availability. Yeah. Yeah. I go ahead, Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, I want to, I would say this is relatable for all of us. Um, and I echo a lot of the things Cash said. For me, I've, you know, looking at those long-term strategic things I can do, I just have to block time on my calendar. I'm very protective of my time. And I, I even go so far as to try to just book customer calls in the afternoon so I can work on strategy in the morning. It doesn't always work out that way, of course. Um, Another thing about our team, um, and I realize this is something we're fortunate to have, but we have awesome support team members directly on the CS team. And so what we've done is our, all of our CSMs have uh, out of office messages on Monday through Friday saying for the quickest, it's saying the truth, we're in meetings and for the quickest response to technical questions, enter a ticket. And um, I know that they'll be taken care of through our support team. And if it needs to get escalated to me, it will be. Um, but that really has saved me a lot of stress over time. I know when I first started, I was definitely in more of a reactive mode responding to everyone. So it's a, it's a learned process yeah. for sure. I like that. I know I got you out of office as I was emailing you about this. Yep. Yeah, that's great. So it's always switched on and it just says, hey, this is, this is the nature of my job, right? I'm not here yeah. to answer your email immediately, uh, but here's the, here's the process if you need help. That's great. It's about expectation setting, isn't it? And really, that's what that boils yeah. down to. And sometimes, you know, we have to reset expectations, but it can also be helpful if we can get our colleagues, particularly those in sales that are passing a customer over to us to set the expectations as well, right? This, not introduce us as, hey, here's your CSM. They're there for whatever you need, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. here's your CSM. Their role is to help you, you know, strategically get the most value out of the product, blah, blah, blah. So I actually, one of, one of my tips is I recommend to CSMs that you actually write a little intro paragraph, sentence or two, and give it to your sales colleagues. When you introduce me, use this exact text that I've written for you so you can control that message and set yourself up for success and not leave it kind of random, just depending on who happens to be uh, closing the deal. Um, so that can, that can be helpful. Martin. Yeah, I, I love that tip because um, I've definitely been in previous roles where that has absolutely happened, where it's just, hey, here's Marta, she'll do everything and anything for you. And then absolutely, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let down the customers. And as I try to set boundaries and as I try to say no, um, which I'll talk about the power of saying no in a second. But as I try to do that, I'm already in a, in a weaker position than I should be because that initial expectation has been set. Luckily, I don't have that issue currently. We do a really good job of having an internal and then an external kickoff with the customer uh, where we really define the roles. A lot of those kinks have been worked out, but it's something that I have seen and I'm sure it's something a lot of other CSMs have experienced in the past. Um, but back to my point about the power of saying no, I love cash what you mentioned about asking for deadlines. Uh, and sometimes I even push back on those deadlines a little bit as well, uh, because it's important to humanize yourself when you're dealing with your customers. I think sometimes, especially as customers get, you know, frustrated or they might get irate, they forget that you're also a human and you also have a number of things on your plate as well that you're juggling. And so um, saying, I won't be able to get this for you at this time, but here's what I can do for you. There's a lot of power in that. 
There's a lot of psychology in this role. We all know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. What's your, what's the typical reaction you get? Do you, you find most people like that, that they they listen and that works the saying no. Sometimes, sometimes they do. And sometimes I just have to reiterate that message a little bit more. Um, and that means just saying it in a slightly different way. I think as long as you say no, but you have a solution, um, that's going to work really well. It's the same when I'm, when I'm putting on my consultant hat and a client has this great idea about what they want to do. Um, and I'll say, you know, that won't work, but I have your best interest at heart. Let me figure out what will work. I think as long as it's positioned in that way, again, not everyone's going to be fully willing to accept it right off the bat, but it's change management is another really big tool that CSMs have to have, to have realistically to, to manage customers well. And it's something that's really powerful in giving you space and giving you time to be not so reactive. Yeah. Wow. You just hit on a big topic there. Change management. But yeah, I mean, that's the business we're in, right? We are helping people yeah. go through change, particularly in onboarding, but, but seriously. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, change management is a fascinating topic that, you know, it's, it's not just about what you say, but how you say it, who you say it to, you know, when you say it, like there's all these different dimensions that can really impact how a message is received. And maybe that's a topic for, uh, for another CSM mastermind. Cause I think that's a, definitely a big one. Um, but very, very relevant. Yeah. So I love, I love the power of saying no for sure. And you know, um, CSMs where right, we have to tell the customer what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And sometimes the two are different. So we don't set anybody up for success by telling them what they want to hear. Um, if we know that we can't meet that deadline or if that strategy that they've come up with is unrealistic or won't work, um, we have to have that tough conversation early. Um, otherwise, it's just going to be hard, twice as bad when we have to have it you know, after they wasted a bunch of time or when we miss that deadline. Right. Great advice. Um, so uh, when we... Th- when you kind of look at work with other people on your team, so, you know, you've got different team sizes around you, but you've been part of other teams, you know, in the past, and you see people who may be earlier in their career in customer success. Um, what are some of the mistakes or traps that you see maybe less experienced or more junior CSMs falling into uh, that you, or maybe you've fallen into in the past, right? And now you know better. Um, and if you could give some advice to maybe some folks listening here a little bit earlier in their career and still working out their own personal strategy for managing time and, and segmenting their accounts, what, what, what advice would you, uh, would you offer? I'm happy to jump in here. Um, I think something that's a pitfall I fell into when I was first in customer success is I was extremely task oriented rather than goal oriented. And I think this also helps with um, blocking out your time and being proactive with your customers. If you understand what their desired outcomes are, if you understand what their business pain points are and you understand what their business goals are and I'll I'll add something else in there. If you understand what their personal goals are as well, and you come up with a plan that's based on that high level rather than, you know, I need to get X or Y out in whatever timeline, you're going to be a lot better off because you're not being reactionary. And so whenever I create my to-do list, I try to group it together in how does this help solve the overall goal that I'm helping my customers solve instead of I just need to do this and I need to do that. And I felt um, with my career as I shifted that mindset, as I got more and more experience, that's really helped me be a lot more strategic with my customers, but also a lot better with my time management as well. Interesting. Why, why, why do you, just digging into that a little bit more, why do you think that helps with time management? Um, because it also allows you to see what you can't delegate to other people. I think 
with customer success, sometimes we think we are alone, but a lot of the times, and the reality is not all customers or not all um, SaaS companies or companies as a whole are at this level, but a lot of the times you are working in a team. There might be some things that sales can help out with. There might be some things that onboarding can help out with. Sometimes it's even something that product can help out with as well and obviously support. And so being goal-oriented instead of task-oriented lets you see, okay, what are things that I can tackle versus what are things that maybe someone else can tackle? I can help them with it, but they might be better suited to help tackle this um, and, and go from there. Got it. Uh, that's great. And, it, and it's really, um, I guess it also helps from the fact that sometimes there might be multiple ways of achieving a goal. And so if we get too focused on the tactics, sometimes we we miss that alternative path that might be uh, better or, you know, it might, it might achieve the same goal, but Mm -hmm. better, you know, what might be the best path might, might shift. Um, And so being able to keep far enough away from the, you know, the tactics so that you can see those opportunities, uh, it, you know, is going to be generally a positive thing. Yeah, absolutely. And echoing what, what Marta said, you're always going to be busy. We all are, as CSMs, are super busy. So if you're seeing the same problems repeat, at some point you just have to carve out the time, put a pause on customer conversations and do something to optimize what, what you're doing. Um, mm-hmm. And that can be hard to do. But uh, luckily, like as I've joined User IQ and this team, gotten to own a work stream for processes for our team and um, I think it's really important to take ownership of how can we streamline things for our team Um, and I know everyone on the call is probably in that same boat yeah so working smarter not just working harder right that that cliche but it's um, but it's true yeah so as you start to so we talked about a lot getting technology in place too soon so that we just end up automating something that maybe isn't a great process, but but having that flexibility to experiment and find out where we spend our time and where the opportunities are for doing things better and more efficiently, and then using technology right. or process to give some structure and some repeatability, um, that that makes sense. So let's talk. I mean, let's talk about process and structure and cash. I think you've probably got some thoughts on this as well, um, because I know you are. You talked about that in your in your intro. Um, what what does what does that look like? How like how does a not very well saying process and structure, but like what does that look like? Do you you know is it a checklist? Is it a you know some some automation? Probably a combination of everything. But what does it look like in in your world? Yeah. So when it comes to processes, there's there's a very intimate balance, right? Because we need processes that can be replicated not only for the CSMs, but also for the salespeople because they're working very closely with us. But CSMs are all time poor. Salespeople have, you know, their own pipeline and I don't want to be disruptive of their workflow. I don't want to put an extra step into their day. I want to make it as seamless as possible. And I think the other thing is, is that for everything that they're doing, I only want them to have to do it once. And I want to be able to make it visible for anyone else who needs to take a look into the account, whether it be the executive team or the salesperson or whoever. So a lot of the processes that I use um, rely on just like, you know, like Google Drive um, on the cloud because that's available to everyone. And um, I also am a big proponent of keeping my receipts when it comes to customers. Um, Number one for account transitions, but number two, even for internal transitions with customers, sometimes they won't know that something's already been done um, or they won't have any insight into that. And then it's just a really good way for us to figure out, you know, who's responsible for which action items. Um, so I have implemented um, two things. I create a Google Drive folder for every single client that I have, and I share it with anybody who will touch that client throughout its life cycle. Um, within that folder has any deck that has ever been shown to that client, their contract, um, and I do running call notes in there as well. I've also created a shared tracker that has um, open items, resolved items, long-term goals, feature requests, and next to each item, I will put the person's name who's responsible for it. 
And then when it's resolved, I don't, I don't put a due date unless I know there is a due date, but once it's resolved, I do track the time from when we were notified to the time when we fixed it just, you know, for, for that purpose of making sure that we're being productive. Um, and that's shared with everyone. We'll usually meet about the tracker once a week, but we don't have to if no one has time because everything is there. You know what you're supposed to be doing. You know when the next call is. You know what the deliverables are. Um, and like I said, between the call notes and the tracker and having all the documents in one place, um, that's a really great way for management to be able to go in and make sure that we're staying on top of things and get a bird's eye view of the account without mm -hmm. having to pull us all in a room and interrupt our day and things like that. Um, and I'm, I mainly have the salespeople make sure that when they're putting their opportunities in Salesforce, if they want to meet with me, that's totally fine. But just making sure that we've identified all of the things they need to put in for the CSM to be successful without the CSM having to go in and be like, oh, well, this contact's missing and, you know, this email's mm -hmm. missing. So I definitely, you know, set that expectation with the sales team as well. And um, we now do... A internal kickoff calls. So I have them fill out a, a scoping sheet. If they want to get a CSM, they have to let us know, you know, what our expectations are, what they've told the client, what they've sold. And I don't want my CSMs to have to go in and look at a contract in a couple of emails and figure it out themselves. I'd rather <laughs> just have it. No, because we, we do that. We will oh, do yeah, that. I'm yeah. <laughs> you know, we will take the time to go hunt all these things down and it just yeah. isn't a good use of our time. So um, you know, in order to get a CSM assigned in Salesforce, we have you fill out the scoping form where you really high level tell us what their expectations are, you know, what goals you've set with them, um, what kind of training they're going to be needing, who the contacts are. And then the CSM has all of that already prepared. Love that. I love that on many levels. I, I talk a lot in, um, you know, in workshops and, and courses that I do about the sort of power balance between the CSM and the customer and how you know, you want that balance to be kind of peer, peer level, like equal, right? You're not like customers not here and you're down here and it's just, they just tell you things to do all day long and you just go and do them, right? You want it to be more of a respectful kind of shared accountability, collaborative type relationship. Um, and what you've just described really is uh, addressing that power balance within your own organization. It's, you know, it's not like, hey, yeah, we've done our job, we've closed the deal, go and figure it all out and, you know, piece together all the evidence and work out what this customer wants, you're actually you're saying to sales, listen, if we're going to make this customer successful, we need to collaborate and we need to, there's certain things that you need to do for me so that I can do this stuff for the customer. And so um, I think that's, that's, the, that's awesome. That's really, really nice. Thanks for sharing. Any other uh, thoughts on um, the kind of the detail of the, of the process, like playbooks and, um, yeah, maybe their you know, their role. How do you how do you use playbooks to to uh, keep structure to things you need to do for customers? Yeah. So the way that we are um, segmenting in terms of playbooks right now is by the two different user types. Um, so we have our super users and our regular users. And right now, in terms of playbooks, we're really looking at what we call enablement strategies, which is we're, we're kind of differentiating between trainings, which are more point and click, and enablements, which are more here's the use case, here's the question that we're trying to answer, show us that, that journey of what we would take. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the sort of segmenting that we're using. We figure... You know, if we have one power user and a bunch of regular users, the power user should definitely be able to drive a lot of that overarching strategy. So for that account, we might only need, you know, several training sessions throughout and maybe one or two enablement sessions. But if we find that, you know, there's a ton of regular users and not really anyone there to oversee, you know, what their end goal is going to be, then that strategy in terms of the playbook that we would initiate would be much more involved, you know, uh, customize enablement sessions, um, segmenting between the different teams. Obviously, if we have like mm -hmm. marketing people and innovations people, they're, they have two different goals in using the product. So we'll dive in a little bit deeper and, and be more customized and hands-on. And we won't just do like a, this is how you use this feature and point and click right. here. It's, it's going to be very use case driven and a lot more collaborative. So those are the mm -hmm. two segmentation paths that we have at the moment. But obviously, mm -hmm. as you know, our customer base matures, we'll probably have a couple more. Love it. Cool. And just a reminder for those of you listening live, you do have the opportunity to put your questions to this expert panel, um, either on some of the topics that they've talked about already or on uh, you know, other general questions about how to use segmentation to maximize the impact that you have with your time. 
Uh, if you want to ask a question, please post it in the Q&A panel. And uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'd love to get through uh, any outstanding questions before the end of the call. Um, Marta, like there, was, there was actually a question from you, Marta, about the, uh, the book. Is there a, from uh, John Bowman, who's, uh, who's uh, listening live. He said, is there a book that you recommend about being goal-oriented rather than task-oriented? Have you got any sort of resource you can recommend? You know, that's a really good question. I don't know if there's a single book that I would point to. Um, I will say I absolutely love Adam Grant. Um, I listened to his podcast, Work Life, and I've read a number of his books. Uh, he's an organizational psychologist, and he talks a lot about how uh, companies can set you up for success as an individual contributor. So, Again, I don't know that I would say there's an individual book. I think that lesson of being goal-oriented versus task-oriented is something that I learned the hard way. Um, but I wish I discovered Adam Grant a lot sooner than, than, you know, in the last two years. Nice. He's helped me a lot since I've discovered him. Fantastic. Cool. If anyone else has got any books who's listening in live, feel free to put, post your book recommendations, Yeah. Let's uh, take some recommendations from the audience as well. Make it as uh, uh, inclusive as possible. Um, cool. Well, uh, what, what, maybe if we just kind of start to sort of wrap this up, we've talked about um, segmentation strategies and the different dimensions that we use to segment accounts. We talked a little bit about operationalization and the balance of using technology, when to use it, when not to use it. Some you know, ideas on, on free tools and apps that, that can help with that process. And then we've talked a bit about time management and how to make sure you actually stick to the plan that you set yourself and you know, how to say no uh, to customers, how to push back and protect your time, how to um, create a dynamic with your colleagues that, that also sets you up for success, doesn't leave you with a bunch of work to do, um, you know, making sure that everybody kind of plays the appropriate role in, in the customer um, journey to success. What else haven't we talked about that would, uh, any, any other tips or tools or techniques or things that we haven't covered that, that you wanna make sure uh, we, we get in before the end of the call? I think one thing um, I haven't touched on that, uh, I used to work for a marketing company, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for marketing and customer success to work together, again, to help with segmentation. One thing at eCompliance I absolutely love is our ideal customer profile. We have done so much in-depth research, and that really helps us understand and identify who our champion should be, and it gives us a really good idea of who we should be going after within an account. Um, to help move the needle if we don't have the right user. Right. And a lot of that is driven by marketing. That's a really good point. And again, probably a topic for another call, um, but I fully agree with you. I think marketing, if you think about what we do in customer success, really there's two parts to it. One is really understanding our customers, who they are and what they're trying to achieve. And the other is giving them information to help them that they need to help you know, achieve those goals. Um, and influencing and motivating, right? Influencing their behavior. And, and really those two things, you know, understanding their needs and influencing their behavior is exactly what marketing does with prospects every day, right? They're always profiling prospects. They're, they're you know, asking them for explicit information, like how big is your company and things like that. But they're also doing other types of, um, uh, they're Im implicit type uh, uh, profiling, right? If they click on this link or if they watch this webinar, then we can assume they're interested in this sort of topic or they've got this sort of pain point. Mm -hmm. So they're really good at that. And I'd love to see marketing get more involved with customers and helping us understand our customers because we can't just do it all by asking them questions on the phone. I mean, it's, it's not scalable, right? It's, it works for some types of customers, but not, not for all. Um, and then the, you know, or another part of our job is helping those customers to take the right, right actions to be successful. And again, marketing is uh our experts at that so yeah i fully agree i think there's a massive opportunity there it's one that a very few companies i see are really tapping into right now many don't um don't even market to their customers about things that they're doing very well which is scary right because your competitors are all marketing to your customers every day 
<laughs> telling them what, mm -hmm. you, what, what you're missing out on, yet we yeah. do a great job of marketing to our own customers about what they've already got access to and what they could be doing with it. So, yeah, big topic. Um, but thanks for bringing it up. Any other uh, tools or tips or any other little pieces of advice before we wrap things out? Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, in terms of segmenting, I think it is incredibly easy for um, CSMs to fall into the revenue renewal um, cycle and just looking at numbers and data and trying to figure out how to segment their book based on that. And I think it's really just important for us to remember that, you know, like Marta said, even though our customers might forget, we are people. And the reason that CSMs exist is to give that added layer of just, you know, humanity to the way that we interact with our customers. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that really helped me segment my accounts was, yes, obviously, revenue and renewal time are important, but just my overall feeling of, you know, whether or not an account is going to be successful is incredibly important. If you can quantify that, even better. But I think, you know, Marta hit on a lot of really, really good points where she was saying, asking questions, making sure that you're being goal oriented and that you're really getting to know your customer and their bottom line. If you're comfortable enough in your ability to gather that information, then you should be comfortable enough in your ability to say, yes, I understand that technically this account is green. No, they're not spending a lot of money with us, but in my opinion, they need a little bit more help. Um, and I think that, you know, when you're looking at your book of business and you're trying to segment it based on a very strict set of criteria, there are going to be opportunities that you're going to miss because you're following, um, you know, an exact formula instead of looking around for some of the outliers. That's, that's awesome and a great topic or great point to end on. So uh, thank you, all of you. Uh, thanks to Marta Montero, uh, who is from eCompliance. Thanks, Marta, for being with us today. Thank you, Cash Young uh, from Signals Analytics. And thank you, Elizabeth Allen from User IQ. My name is James Scott from Success Coaching, and you've been listening to CSM Mastermind.